We up and running now. Yes, we are. Doing a mic now. check? Yes, we are. All right, sounds good to me. Hey, team. All right, we are going to continue working on uh, Spelljammer Combat and Exploration. What is up, folks? I'm Ian Spilkruni. I create role playing games, I illustrate them, I publish them online. The past year, I've been focusing my attention on Spelljammer Combat and Exploration. And now that that document is finished, we have the ground foundation for us to actually dive into the real work, which is creating fucking cool shit based off of the combat and exploration supplement that we created. So, hey, Dennis, how you doing? Glad to see you around, my man. So, we are going to, uh, let's see, uh, just uh, to, to clean up our intro here, I just posted that I'm, on, uh, that I'm live on the X Twitter platform. If you are also on the X Twitter platform, you can follow me at Phil Kearney. Big shout out to the Spelljammer subreddit. Fantastic place to go learn about Spelljammer. Uh, ask questions, get answers, sharpen your knives. Uh, if you like what we're doing here, like, subscribe, hit the bell icon to get notifications when I am live in the future. And we picked up new subscribers. Thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate you guys helping me grow. It's really kind. And I'm glad that I'm, I assume lead on adding some value to your game and stuff. So, cool. Uh, for those that are interested, Spelljammer Combat and Exploration is here on the DMs Guild. Uh, it's gotten a couple five-star reviews. It's already a silver medal earner, and it has an extensive full preview. Along with about a hundred some odd, well, now it has about 120 different assets for tokens, ships, maps, uh, charting um, tokens, playmats, and stuff for you to be able to run light as Raxus, as well as any other campaign that you would want using the mechanics that are inside of Spelljammer Combat and Exploration. And like I said, now that the thing is published, we can actually do what we wanted to do, which was build fucking cool shit. So, um, cool shit involves. All right, so we're making a 500-foot battle crab right now. That is, uh, it's big. <laughs> so let me see if I can get rid of my echo here real quick before we continue on. I can, I can hear myself. And I know that's an issue of my microphone being, so they tell me if I mute myself, then I'll think I'm a bot and I'll decline myself. But okay, is this an add-on to Spelljammer? Oh, the, uh, the Spelljammer Combat and Exploration? Uh, that's, uh, geez, McCrow, man. If, uh, if you haven't seen, yeah, go check out the free preview. It's, uh, it's a deep dive into uh, ship combat and, well, exploration. It fills out all, all those little, like, <laughs> now you've got me geeking out. Hold on. Let's go take a look real quick. Uh, this has got um, some uh, deep dive rules into, uh, well, here's some of the assets that we built. But basically, like, um, the combat chapter here. Has got a deep dive into like mechanical uh, mechanics into scaling combat at the 550 and five foot scale. It provides mechanics for moving fluidly from one scale to another during combat or exploration if you're moving at different scales of size. This is to uh, make it easy for characters to actually be able to integrate ship combat into their 5e game mechanics. And if we go back up to the table of contents here, uh, we can take a look at ship rolls real quick. So the action economy of ship rolls is based off of the actions that you take, not the role that you play. So it's kind of a misnomer. Uh, a pilot uses their, uh, inter uh, their object interaction at like steer your ship. Uh, you can use actions to move, hide, uh, take actions to attack, uh, bonus actions as well to take other special maneuvers while you're piloting and as well as reactions. Siege commander and squadron commander options. Siege commanders command crews of siege crew uh, weapons, so like ballistas, catapults, trebuchets, and stuff. You command the crew of people that fire the weapons so that you would be able to fire multiple siege weapons per turn using your own action economy of verbal taking command of a crew and then using attacks to make multiple attacks. There's also a reload mechanic involved with it and reactions as well. Squadron command is the same as siege command, but instead of commanding individual, uh, individual creatures to load and fire siege weapons, a squadron commander is, here, I'll, I'll show you the mechanics on that real quick. Um, squadrons and fleets. Squadron commander, okay, so if we've got um, siege, like, a, like a, uh, a siege commander can command multiple siege weapons at the same time or individually, just depending on how powerful your character, like what level your character is, you can command more weapons fluidly. But uh, once you get into squadrons, it's kind of the same. The, the, you can group multiple ships into the same squadron so you can command them as a single unit. And beyond that, as a fleet, 
you can command multiple ships in a unit. Um, you can command multiple ships at the same time as, well, as, as, a, as a fleet. So you can have like multiple fighter craft attacking a ship at the same time, or you can have uh, multiple squadrons of ships attacking. Uh, so the fleet mechanics is, is basically, it, it breaks it all down. It all uses the same 5e action economy, movement abilities, and, a lo and almost all the same um, uh, character features, class features and feats and stuff like that all work but instead of five foot scale for your character it's 50 foot scale for fighter crafts and 500 foot scale for war vessels and then larger than over a mile away it gets outside of ship combat range because you can't effectively have like melee combat if something's a mile away from you until you close distance in which you can so this provides a deep dive into mechanics of like maneuvering squadrons and fleets together engaging ships in combat as you go it also has a real deep dive into like uh, uh, spell casting and upcasting spells so you can cast things on ships themselves or to scale things up to deal with planetary issues without and the mechanics in here prevent you from like destroying entire cities with one spell so it's really good in that sense it's pretty well balanced and that allows you to use your spells to cast spells um, and, use your, and you can tie in your action economy as a pilot or as a siege commander or as a support character to use your spell casting to either help with siege attacks, squadron ships, as well as your own ship itself. Um, scaling distance during exploration, mechanics about visibility rules. If we drop down uh, like into the hazard section, it talks about um, starting fires, putting them out, uh, the effects of foul and deadly air and how that can shift. Um, types of infestations that can affect your ship. It's all resolved with team activities so that your team can work together to resolve a hazard. Um, mutinies is also part of morale and wild storm systems as well. So then we have a breakdown of creature menageries, uh, of ships and, and creatures interacting at the 50 and 500 foot scale. And uh, a wild space system generator so that you can create your own systems. And in the exploration chapter here, uh, we have a, uh, a section on orbital speeds, uh, planet positioning, how to map planets in a wild space system, uh, the, uh, how um, like orbiting planets around a central star versus orbiting moons around a planet, the speed and the timing involved with that for tracking during a long-form campaign. Um, and then we take all the stuff from all these chapters and we apply them to Light as Raxus. So if you're interested in Lies Raxus or if you want to see how all these mechanics can be placed in a practical setting, then we've converted all of Lies Raxus to utilize these mechanics, introducing additional combat um, uh, encounters. Like um, instead, of, uh, instead of when you get off the Lucent Edict to, into the asteroid field, instead of having a jump scare of a night spider running away because the cops showed up just in time, uh, we have an encounter where you're actually trying to fight and maneuver with um, different uh, Niyogi ships inside of this asteroid belt that looks suspiciously like a dungeon. So you can see how the transfer from uh, a five foot scale dungeon space can be implemented at the 500 foot scale inside of an asteroid system. And we make use of the squadron mechanics in here so that your ship is fighting both a squadron of spiderling fighter craft as well as its mothership Ibn Snare. And then when you really want to get into squadron mechanics deeper, um, there's also a Topolis Tower where we have uh, you, you can have some fighter skiffs fighting um, the uh, the scavers that are infesting the area and harassing Topolis. We added an entire asteroid field for scavers to run and hide inside of, so that you can have a run and gun adventure while you're waiting for Topola uh, and your ship to repair. Um, and then in the last chapter, it really leans into squadron and fleet mechanics for when you get into uh, Zaraxxus space, you've already assembled a fleet of all the ships that are in the, uh, ally, uh, in the, in the ally fleet that you win favor of in uh, uh, Doom Space at Vokas base. The, the, you've got a bunch of different factions that are there hanging out and you go through this diplomacy um, event, the, this like a, a diplomacy challenge to win their favor so that they'll lend ships to the cause to help you defeat the Zaraxian, uh, um, Zaraxian fleet. So once you assemble all the ships in the fleet to do so, we can drop down into the actual Zaraxian Armada is here defending their fortress. 
Uh, these are warbirds that are staying inside to basically intercept fire that could otherwise damage the citizens that are on the uh, that are on the asteroid. And then you have the Star Moth Squadron here of four ships showing up in eight different squadrons here to fight against the six different squadrons that you form with your allies. Uh, we added maps for both the top side and underside of the uh, Citadel of Light. These are all assets that are in the in the zip file when you buy the thing. Uh, it's got the uh, it, it's got the um, uh, the Radiant Citadel has a star beam that gathers energy from the sun and then basically unleashes a, a, a radiant damage lightning bolt with a two mile range to deal damage to ships that get within there so that there's a, a threat to stay. Like if you stay too far away from the Citadel, you're like, we're sitting ducks. You got to get in close to, to not get picked off. And, uh, and then once you get through all that stuff, there's uh, alternate missions on how to get onto the Citadel, whether you're doing well or poorly in the Armada combat. And taking all that stuff, if we go back to Doom Space uh, inside of the adventure, what we're doing currently is uh, the way that the adventure is structured, and spoiler alerts, the way that structure is when you're at, when you're at Vocath's base in Doom Space, these are the different faction um, ships that are uh, parked around Vocath's base and are showing up and hanging out and partying and stuff. And during that course, um, the, a, 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 a small fleet of Zaraxi and Starmoths show up and surround Vokas base. So this is how you would position these things in squares. And it basically becomes a, a, a social encounter because you're out, you're outgunned, you're outmanned, you're outfired. Um, so what we're doing now is we are creating a 500 foot battle crab to, here I'll show you how this looks. Um, here's the squadrons that were gathered around Vokath's base. Here's a squadron of the Star Moths that are under the command. But this is what the battle, this is what the 500 foot combat crab looks like when all its legs extend out and its claws unfurl from underneath the base. So um, the illustration in Lazarax is this is the base, right? It's got all these goofy crystals and stuff underneath. You're like, what the fuck is all, all that about? Well, I, I just decided that what, what that should be about is, um, you know, the, these are the crystals that unfurl into legs and giant claws, and it's got this giant laser beam that shoots out of it. So when you have Vokath's crab, a 500-foot mega ship, plus all your allied ships, it's actually an, e it's actually an even fight against the 12 Star Maws. So you don't have to defeat the Star Maws. The way that we're going to write this encounter is that as long as you can get rid of half of the Star Moth ships before your fleet is destroyed, you're going to win over everyone automatically because you're showing that in the face of danger, your characters take command and get shit done. And that's exactly what all these warring factions respect. And you gain Vokath's favor on top of it. So as a, as a fleet combat, you can punch uh, Zealoth in the face really get him pissed off at you, make him tuck his tail and run away back to Zaraxxus space. And now everyone's excited to rally around your characters and throw their lives at this thing to help you guys win the day. So it's a way, um, there's, a, there's a thing about fifth edition adventures where they disempower you and set you up to be in these combat encounter, like these, these fake combat encounters where you're not supposed to fight because it's overwhelmed and the guidance is to steer you away from combat. But those things always rub me wrong because I have the kind of players that if they can take a shot, they don't care if they miss the devil or not. They just want to take a shot at him. So I want to build encounters where you can empower character the players, those those aggressive characters, aggressive players that express that aggression through their characters where like if I'm not willing to be heroic and brave and take on impossible odds as a character, how am I supposed to ever expect to do that in my real life? In my mind, D&D is training on courage, on how to assess threats, pick your chances, and take your shots when you think you can. So I want to create adventure encounters that replace all the disempowerment that that wizards keeps investing, like keeps keeps infesting in their adventures to disempower adventures to make them passive, to instead create scenarios where they can turn the whole thing on its nose and make them a threat that the that the villains in the adventure have to respect. So when you come to their doorstep, they have to deal with you. And when it's, you got a bunch of NPCs and commoners and stuff that you have the uh, opportunity to embarrass the villain in front of, 
It just it makes your characters feel like heroes. It makes the villains feel stupid, and the players get more invested. So I just think it's better game design. So once I saw that this was something that could be done, um, I got really excited to build it. So that's what we're in the process of doing. I, I want to create. I, I want to. I love fifth edition. I, I'm af I'm afraid that the that the 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 um, the intent of being like I I I question whether the people that write official adventures for Dungeons and Dragons knows or or ever had the experience of being disempowered in their life. It, it's there's a lot of there's a there's a there's a lot of like me too that's going on in, in a lot of industries right now where people feel marginalized and they're trying to express their individuality. But at fear of being canceled here, I, I will say, I think what's really missing in our culture is heroism. And when we can create adventures where you can demonstrate your heroism and where you can demonstrate taking risks and where you're willing to put your own, your own health, your own safety, um, set your selfishness aside, and be willing to take a shot when you know something is wrong. That's something I think that's been quelled a lot in in culture right now, and I think it's being expressed in the adventures that are being created for Dungeons and Dragons right now. So, without getting too much on a high horse or a political kick, I, I I want to create games where people feel empowered that they can make a difference and have the opportunity to take a shot, whether they succeed or not. They can be recognized as heroes. And as long as the team can fight off the Zaraxian fleet here, then all of the people that you're supposed to be impressed, that you're supposed to impress, will be impressed. And you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, being a hero, taking the leadership mantle, leading a fleet into battle against impossible odds. And that's heroism. And that's a lot of what D&D was originally built around. And when I see those things possible inside of fifth edition adventures i i want to try to pull on that as much as i can to bring that out and um and so that's that's the, that is the first project that i decided to work on since finishing the book it's it's a way to i think just make lives Axis that much cooler so that's what we're doing forgive my forgive my rant but that's that's kind of where i'm coming from so um let me catch up here real quick crab boy that's right what is up shay uh, looks fun how many crew... Oh, um, Spelljammer ships can be piloted by one character. Uh, you only need one to push the thing as long as it's 500 feet or smaller. It only requires one pilot to maneuver and then to work melee weapons. But these are all trebuchet. And trebuchet have a crew of seven. So, uh, but in this instance, Vocath being, an arc, uh, being a, a Mercane uh, can afford animated... Uh, siege weapons. They're they're basically automatons that operate like kind of like uh, animated ballistas from Magic: The Gathering. They are they are um, sentient construct, well semi sentient constructs that can be directed with a verbal command to load, aim, and fire themselves. So all we have to do is just make sure that they have a, uh, a an, enough rocks to be able to get through the battle. And this is a conveyor belt system that feeds uh, that that basically drops onto and starts mulching asteroids, and then it takes it into its belly and turns it into, uh, it mulches it down to trebuchet-sized trebuchet stones that can then be fed to the animated ballistas. So he doesn't actually need a crew of, uh, uh, of uh, sorry, trebuchet. He doesn't need trebuchet crew because they're all animated themselves, although they can be if necessary. So we're in the process of building out all the separate decks. I like how this looks from the top side, but we need to blow it apart uh, because as we saw in the uh, upper levels, let me get back to it here to show it. There we go. Uh, we've got uh, the top deck here is where the trebuchet are. The second deck is where uh, is the is a landing platform and interior space for where the mulching happens, the asteroids. Uh, then you've got this, the third and fourth deck here is an empty space. Uh, it's a hollow space along the uh, along the, the gravity plane. So anything that's in this 40, like this, this is like a like a 40 foot by, um, no, it's it's like 20 feet by about 50 feet in length. The each square is 50 feet. This is not to scale, so that would actually be about well, what would that be? Anyway, um, that's yeah, that's probably actually about the, well, this is 100 feet, so that's about yeah, about 50 feet of open space that can basically house an entire ship itself. But since it's on the central gravity plane, 
anything that's kept in storage here has zero weight. So there's bay doors here off the back end that can be opened up and you can just dump shitloads of, uh, of inventory, cargo, and storage in there. And the gravity flips. So uh, on this side, this is the uh, living quarters for Vocath's personal, uh, personal soldiers, um, as well as um, like, uh, like a kitchen and all, all the amenities that you need to make this place work. And then back here, this is Vocast Tower. So like this is his meeting room and this is his personal, uh, this is his personal living quarters. This is the arena. Um, this is the underside of the arena. Um, this is the uh, grandstand of uh, the, uh, the, the balcony where um, observers can be. Um, it's really messy looking, but this is the private booth where Vocath is at. And this is the top of the arena. This is the glass dome that's over it. Here, there's the uh, the mirror, the uh, uh, the soul trapping mirror where he keeps all the monsters that he can then um, activate the mirror to project their image into uh, into the arena for anyone to fight. But at the same time, in, during combat that we saw here, it can also be used as an energy beam weapon. It just basically reflects radiant energy from the mirror through the glass roof through this targeting lens to be able to deal large amounts of radiant damage to individual ships as, as like a, like kind of like a, like a, a fire bolt, but like a amplified fire bolt or alternatively as an action, the pilot can uh, use their action to project any creature that's trapped inside the mirror up to a mile away. So you could target an incoming ship and you could drop like, uh, like a 150 foot megapede onto the ship and it could just shred the ship before it even gets to you. Or he's got like some Braxit that are trapped up inside of there. Braxit are huge size, uh, basically meat shield creatures. He could drop those onto a deck of a ship and they can start just tearing apart siege weapons and throwing and knocking siege crew off of the deck um, into wild space so they aren't able to assist anymore. It fucks up your action economy and loading and reloading weapons. And this guy's on your side. So this is the main tank that helps support the team while you're taking on the Zaraxxus fleet. And again, all you got to do is really take out, there's, there's 12 ships that come at you from, from Zaraxxus. If you can take out, you know, six, eight of them, then they're going to have to turn tail and get the hell out of there. So all you have to do is hold out for about three or four rounds of combat before Zaraxians realize they bit off more than they can chew and now they need to get out. And since they, and since they fronted on the Murkanes, the Murkanes kind of have a policy of, if you front on me, we tear you apart, and now the now the whole Murkane species is in, is backing you on taking out uh, taking out Zaraxxus and everyone being done with these crazy astral elves doing their bullshit. So that's the idea that goes on behind that stuff. So, hey, thanks a lot. It's yeah, I I don't do I, I don't I don't do simple. <laughs> it's gonna take a while for me to build this thing. But uh, where's the, oh, what, the, the link to the book? Wait, you can't see anything? Let me double check my shit here real quick. There we go. It, it should all be, it should all be there. Yeah, good. And then the link is uh, to the book, the link is here in the description if you want to check it out you're certainly welcome to uh oh yeah and while we're and while we're here uh if you want to jump into my discord i just updated the link today it's on the about page of my patreon and while you're there it's a buck to, to participate and people that are on my patreon get first right to votes and seats in play tests so um you know if the days line up for you so uh discord here and the uh, spell jammer book here the full playlist for all 365 episodes is here and uh, my other dms guild stuff like the color mana system for mtg spell point warlocks packs and patrons of ravnica different warlock options for ravnica uh theurgy ability check casting all that stuff is there so you can check out that stuff if you want but uh okay so where are we at uh we have uh we have this deck i need to start I need to build. Uh, I need to build the interior. So, going back to our profile. That's the wrong profile. Let's go to. Is that the one where? Thumbnail. There we go.
cool. All right, so let's see. We have the, I need this, I think I need to start. Ugh, I need to peel this thing apart, but I'm not sure. I'm, uh, it's a little delicate. I need to figure out how to sequence this stuff properly. Um, what I want, well, first I should probably get rid of the thumbnail. So this is gonna be a little clumsy, so bear with me, guys. I'm, I'm trying to sort stuff out. We started working on the top side, and that's how the top side looks with the uh, with the lab and stuff. This is all underneath the the uh, where the um, where the arena is at. But these uh, this walkway around the arena can fold should be able to fold in. I just haven't figured out the specifics of how to express that quite yet. So we're still sussing through stuff. I gunk. The more difficult part is going to be the underbelly. And I need to pull the underbelly apart. So I have that there. Um, so this is this is at a higher elevation than here and the and the uh, and the leg gears. So this is its own layer here that I need to I need to pick I need to pick that off. So let's see how I can do that. This is the damselfly that's parked. These are the turrets that sit up top. That's the actual crab. That's how I do it. Okay. So I'm going to Don't need. I don't need that. So I can get rid of that. I can copy paste, and let's just clean this up so it's a separate layer. I used to do when Spelljammer first came out. It was like back in. God, when was that? Um, I want to say, was it 89 that it came out? I knew I was in my teens. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I remember I remember spending hours making floor plans for huge size ships. Because I because back back then, okay, so I, I, I started on Beckme, like with like Red Box and Expert Handbook stuff. And then uh, I quickly got moved into in, in like... Uh, um, First edition uh, was a thing, but like within two years of me discovering D&D, second edition happened, and then Spelljammer happened, and then Planescape happened, and Dark Sun happened, and all that stuff was just ridiculous. Like I think I, I want to say uh, I want to say Dark Sun came out, I think in '92, maybe '93. I was just going to college when Dark Sun happened, and boy, that stuff was the cat's meow. But um, uh, hold on real quick. I want to clear this out. But so I I'd spent my my earliest formative years of D and D in Beckme, where the whole the whole point of adventuring was to eventually gain your own castle and to have your own you know your own your own minions and and to build your own domain right dominion style of play. So I, I talk about it a lot. And uh, and so when Spelljammer happened, obviously your ship is your is your fort, it's your home. So I always wanted to build mass like the monarch, like the the massive butterfly ships that the elves had, the the dwarven citadel, um, the the ogre mammoth. These were all super huge like mega ships that uh, that I absolutely loved. And so um, uh, I when when that setting came out, I would spend a ton of time building not nearly as, as good as I do now but at the time um, I was uh, really into building massive structure ships to uh, to, to be you know the, a floating fortress for my team like to have a wizard's lab in it and all the bloody blah that goes with that so I'm gonna I'm gonna name this we're gonna name this um, uh, battle um, battle deck there we go and we'll put our turrets on the battle deck with the frame 
So that takes care of that. And now we'll go back into here and we need to build, um, close that up and go here. Close that. I want to go here. I can, so I, can, I have this here now, so I can strip away um, the walls here. I want to duplicate this layer so I don't fuck anything up. Save. I'm going to drop this down here. We're going to call this, what are we going to call this? Um, um, this would be the. Um, What's what would be the name of this? Um, the um, there's, well, there's there's a landing platform for the damsel fly. There's a loading and unloading crane. There's a hole that goes down into the under storage. So this would be. Um, a landing deck. Let's just call it the landing deck until I find a better word. Sent some text in the wall over there. Eight, thank you, 89. Yeah, it's a beast. Did I want to get rid of that? No, I, I don't think I did. I'm going to bring that back. I do want to get rid of this. I'm gonna build the interior space like that. These are 50 foot squares, obviously. So, because um, because uh, Mercaner size large, they're 10 foot. They occupy 10 foot spaces. So this is uh, effectively one, two, three, four, almost five. So this is about this is like a 15 foot wide staircase, which is sufficient. You know, it, it's spacey enough for the Mercaner to climb up and down. Which is, he wants, obviously, he, you want to make sure that the master of your ship is able to access all points on. I don't have to worry about symmetry so much here right now. But I do want to. Resolve this interior space. Let's see. The interior doesn't have to be nearly as thick as the exterior. We'll go with the walls. Mm, go with the walls being there in general. So far, so good. But yeah, we're just gonna we're just building floor deck plans here right now. It's kind of how it goes. Don't have to worry about symmetry right now. Just need to get things built properly so we can build the interior top deck underbelly thank you 
penalty timer. Don't have to worry about that. Stay here. Oh, that feels pretty good. It's a little off. Let's zoom in a little bit more. See if we can hit that mark. Too thin. Now we're just gonna have to go with it. All right, line that up. Come on, line that up. There we go. Yeah, that'll do. So once we get the map done, we'll have to build a um, a little like a, you know like a, like a like a floor plan guy with numbers and stuff. And once we have that down, we'll build a, a, a combat stat sheet for the for the crab itself, and um, and then we'll build the actual encounter. Uh, I'm I'm pretty solid on the the. Uh, uh, the statistics of the ship itself it's pretty easy to build them i mean when, once you look at the the equipment uh, the, uh, the the ships and equipment section it's pretty easy just to build a ship and then uh when you go down into the combat chapter and and pluck out some weapons melee weapons and ranged siege weapons it's it's easy to build that out so creating ships on a fly is incredibly easy with this system so i already know what i already know what the ships are and the fleets are but i just want to get a little bit further along here and, uh, and and get um, get my feet underneath me with the um, with the martial powers play test that we're doing on Saturday. I think in May. Uh, I typically take a week off uh, in, in May uh, every year, and I think this year I'm going to um, use May to uh, run a play test for this siege encounter. It's just a combat encounter. It's not going to last long. Um, it's, it's just basically going to be initiating combat uh, with the characters in command of a fleet to um, fight Zealoth and his fleet of Star Maws. So that'll probably be, I reckon that'll probably be on a Thursday night, um, maybe on a Monday. I'm not, I'm not 100% sure how that's going to line up, but uh, maybe a Monday night, one or the other. But uh, it'll be during the weekday. It'll be in a weekday night. So I'll, I'll um, recruit people that are interested. I'll, I'll reach out to my um, $1 Patreon members first, and then I'll put it out to the Discord in general. As long as I have at least three players, we'll be good to go. But a, a crew, uh, like having five characters total would be ideal, I think. And the characters would take command of the entire fleet of both Vocats, Crab, and all of the uh, visiting uh, faction leaderships as well. And the way that the, uh, the, the way that the range system works on here, uh, if we go back up to the exploration chapter, a fleet of, of star moths would occupy a one mile space because you can only like like uh, like we saw um, down down below here. You can only fit inside of a 500 foot square, right? You know, we get back down to the get back down to the fleets. I'll show you. You can only really fit. This is a this is a 10 by 10 space of uh, of 50 foot squares. And a star moth is 200 feet long, so you can in this 500 by 500 foot space, you can only really put about four star moths without them basically touching tail to tip and wing to wing. It's a little bit too tight of a formation for my comfort. Um, so basically, you can only fit four uh, per square. So if you have a fleet of uh, 12 ships, that's going to be uh, three or four squares at the 500 foot scale which means that we're going to be in the territory of a fleet occupying a one mile space. A one mile space is a 10 by 10 space at the 500 foot scale or a one mile square, right? So if we're using my visibility mechanics for detecting incoming objects, and of course he always has an assistant on lookout, keeping an eye through the, uh, through the wild space orrery to scan for distant targets. And if we're looking at the one mile scale here, uh, a detection range of one million miles 
uh, basically means you have 10 minutes of prep time before that fleet arrives. So all you have to do is make a DC 19, and if you fail that, um, you can, uh, at the uh, 100,000 mile scale, it'd be a DC 16. And, um, and then using an Ori station, uh, 10,000 mile scale would be 13, it'd be a 13, and the notice range for 10,000 miles would be 16. And just noticing with your bare eye at a thousand miles, it'd only be a DC of 13. So ideally, basically the way that it would set up is that we just assume that whomever is the scout that's on lookout for Vokath while he's conducting his games, will assume that he hits the DC 19. And, uh, the, um, and so that gives everyone 10 minutes incoming fleet, prepare yourself. And we'll just set the narrative of Vokath already fucking hates the elves. So when he sees them approaching, it pisses him off. And he's, and he's willing to help push them away. If you have the princess with you, you don't want Zelf getting anywhere near you. And she's like, look, I can't have this guy catching me. I have no idea what he's going to do. He's insane. It's like, well, we better make sure he doesn't show up. So that triggers Vokath thinking if she becomes queen, then there's going to be a, a potential lucrative deal here that you can start generating and everyone in doom space would be on your side so the it goes hey incoming fleet well let's push them away let's get hostile so that gives everyone 10 minutes to basically move 300 feet to get on board their ships power up pilot get into formation and stand off against zealous fleet when they show up and they're like give me my sister we're gonna be like take her I was like, okay, we will. And then you roll initiative, and if you can punch them in the face, they'll run away, and then yada, 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 yada. So um, there you go. That's, that's like the gist of it. But it, it, changes, it changes the relationship of everything in the storyline, like I was talking about earlier. So what I want to do is start thinking about like a refinery sort of thing in here. Anyway, that's what I got going on. That's that's the idea behind all this. Uh, that goes there, and I want to feed this in a bit more. Let's merge that down. Uh, no, merge down. I've just started getting into Spy Family. Um, the uh, Hulu has an English dub version of it. And uh, they have the first and second season. And holy crap, I fucking love Spy Family. I've heard good things about it, and I completely agree. It is a, it is an awesome show. One of the, um, one of the best anime. I would say it's probably the best anime I've seen since Evangelion. But I'm also an old school manga guy, so my opinions are biased. Merge. Merge that as well. Let's go to the mulcher. Hmm. 
I'm okay with that being there. We just need a way to, to get this upstairs. What if I what if I duplicated that? Perfect, perfect. Hmm, okay. Um, let's see. How would I do this? I'd go. squeezing on the, the trebuchet that's there. I need to, okay, so maybe I do need to put this here so it can reach here, it can reach here. this thing so that it's able to reach everywhere so that might mean I need to rearrange where the trebuchet are positioned and I'm okay with that This could work out. Okay. Uh, let's try that. There's plenty of space for access from the stairs so that you aren't squeezed in. And as long as we're maintaining equal distance for everything, we should be able to pinch this all in. Yeah, I like that. I think that's going to work. If we transform. Why are you way out here? All right, all right. Uh, free, um, free transform. No, free transform. Go vertical. I don't know what's going 
on down there, but whatever. Let's try that for a bit. Very, very close. There we go. Okay, cool. Now everything is just about within reach. Let's conceal that. this then let's grab feels off. Nope, yep, that's sitting pretty. Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, I can see it now. These back two are crowded a bit. I feel like these are crowded a little bit. Form for vertical. There we go. Not quite a circle, is it? I think it's okay though. I think we're doing okay here. Hmm. 
What do you think? Does that sit pretty? Is a little is a little elongated. It's like it's not. A, oh, I, I I can see that's off still. What is up with you and being off, my dude? Battle deck turrets. I see. Good. We're good. Free transform. Flip particle. I'm telling you, man, that feels. It is a little off. Let's push that out. Push that out. But am I okay with that? Does it need... It can afford to be a little bit more circular, right? Yeah. And open. Um, let's grab you. One. One. Two. That feels better. Duplicate. The sexy word world of ship design and deck plan building. Revel in the glory. Revel with me, my friends, for we are reveling. Yeah, I think I'm okay with that. So we have our... Main usage here. Let's trim that down a touch. I'm not on the right layer, am I? Oh, no, I am. How about that? Nope, I'm not. There we go. Merge down. Pasty. There. That ain't working. That's the way you do it. Let's see. I don't need. I don't need this interior wall. Until we get outside. Is if I clip that wall. This creates an interior space. Do 
feed these through. Exterior, interior, exterior, interior, exterior, interior. There we go. Can I hit my marks? Jesus. Thank you. Okay, so that's interior space. So this becomes exterior. That's cool. Um, let's see. I'm gonna add the. I'm gonna add that back on here. Nice. becomes our interior, exterior, safe. What if I, nope, that has to stay the same. Right, must preserve the outer frame. This is all outer frame. This is not important right now because we're just gonna mirror it. I can at least minimize the amount of mirroring that needs to happen. So we can square that up. Yeah, I can get rid of that. This is the interior space that we're actually dealing with. Um, that means I need Where's my music? What? All right, let's refresh it. External space. I 
let's see. I feel like there should be doors over here too. I'm gonna merge this down. Merge that down. One door, three door, one, two, three door. Okay, I'll go with that. Um, sussing out what I need. Um, this isn't a bad place for storage and like repair stuff. Okay, so what else do we need? I'm gonna merge that down. Yeah, it's about it's about ten feet wide, right? Not quite 10 feet. That's a 10 foot door. That's a 10 foot gap. That works out. Ten foot. Sweet. This vocab needs to be able to get to everywhere inside his ship. Ten foot gap, pulling out junk, ten feet, that's smooth. Um, I think I want to pull that mulcher and bring that forward a little bit more.
There, now it's just conveyor belts down after getting shredded down the conveyor to the gap. chamber that quick I just want to have a, a belt maybe I just want to hmm. nah. there's down Rush a miracle, kid, you get a rotten miracle. Yeah, if we keep the chamber small like that, then rocks will always be available within reach. So we can reduce the space in that chamber down to there. This works out. I just need to put a door in it. Doesn't take a lot. Hey there, Timely Timer. How we doing? What time is it? Nine o'clock? Okay, still got a little bit of time left. Let's keep at this. I'm okay with just there being a back feed of tonnage of rock just on the conveyor belt that it just pushes that you just, you know, swallow a little bit more and it pushes down to the end. Now the door here that opens up so that you can check out how the rocks are doing in there. If there's a, a blockage along the way somewhere. So that probably means we need to duplicate this free transform. wrong button.
side doors to check the conveyor belt. This makes sense that you would have that. Merge that down. Cool little conveyor belt space. That's all part of the machine. So the when your essence, when you're piloting and your essence is infused into the ship, you can move all the pieces of it as though it was your own body. So you could literally be chewing and swallowing while you have rock on the conveyor belt like it's on your tongue. So you'd feel that you wouldn't have to do anything with it. You can disengage your feelings so you don't choke. But that's the idea that this would be a, a full of rock. And when you feel that it's getting empty, when you, you know, because it's a, a spell jamming helm, you can see anywhere you want on the ship at any time. So you would be able to sense what's going on inside this conveyor belt space. We're getting a little low on rock. It's time to go chew up another asteroid. So then we just bring this maw down, la, 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 chew on it until the conveyor belt kicks in and then you start feeding gravel back to here that then gets picked up by these loading claws that drop down here pick up and it can drop here drop here drop here part of the crew experience of commanding these things together i think that i think that all kind of jives on two A little bit of dangerous space walking through the middle of that, so I think I want to have a um, a uh, a little bit of a gap. One, two. One, two. Can I bring that forward? Do I want to do that? I feel like I can afford to one, one, two, two. Okay, that feels better. So we have a bit of a wall gap here that allows you to be medium size at least can easily move around there. Large size could squeeze through, but I can't see Vocap wanting to hang out on the battle deck. He just needs to have access to it. Time enough for you to get a watch. Ah! Shut up! <laughs> that joke's horrible. Uh, we're doing okay there. Yeah, these all this this all feels like it's within reach. This telescope's a little bit so. Well, all those are within distance. Um, right now I'm thinking about um, a battery of anti-personnel weapons uh, along here and here 
but that's a that's a good space there so I'm happy with that oh my god it's almost exactly in the right spot that's fucking fantastic It's the worst dad joke ever, my dude. Glad to have been a part of it. There's that. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I'm okay with that. Time for a sip of water, a celebratory sip of water. Okay, so we have all this gap in here. That's like 50 feet worth of space. I'm, I'm feeling like there should just be like storage, like equipment storage in here. It's the, it's the, it's like it's all the, it's all the repair equipment and stuff that you need from the trebuchets up top. There's an access gate here with a crane, so we can lift stuff up and down. Maybe I, maybe I. Maybe I want to open up this space so we can move materials. Yeah, maybe that's what we need to do. Maybe we actually need to open this space up. Yeah, so if we need to, so now we can start filling the area with like um, access. I'm screening a weird flippy thing, so I'm gonna hit save here because that's freaking me out. Something about that's not feeling right.
how's that feel? Okay with that. I could just, you know, fill this up with boxes of equipment and stuff. I mean, that's kind of a cheat, but it can be done. It's not, it wouldn't be the worst crime, and there needs to be repair parts here at this place. Exactly, where do we go from here? feet worth of space that's a lot of I mean well these are some big fucking parts so it's not necessarily a bad thing right Big old double doors, 20 feet wide. The width of this piece of equipment here. That's, that's the proper answer. Large open space that can allow for big pieces of machinery to be moved in and out of this space. That is the correct answer. So yeah, this is just, this is just weapon deck storage. I'm okay with that. And my computer just locked up. And I don't necessarily need to build anything on the interior here right now because we just figured out how this place works. Um, what's the top deck look like again? Yeah, we really did lock up. Close that, reopen it. There we go. Oh! Is that real? Oh, wait a second. Let's, um... Don't need this. Do need the battle deck though. Let's do that. I spy with my eyes somebody who's writing some text.
Maybe I do want to have it facing the other way. Now I can take things from inside here, pick them up and bring them up here. That works. You know, sometimes you just need a weapon deck storage. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's just, it's just, yeah, I'm just thinking like, do I need to populate this room with a bunch of like, like room rooms, like, like, uh, like, like uh, sleeping quarters and kitchen and stuff. And, and I'm thinking no, because its purpose is utility for the weapons deck, feeding stone into the face of the machine and moving parts around. So it would be full of gears and pistons and bolts and just equipment to uh, to uh, trigger um, um, mending spells with, you know, um, to, to, to have materials on hand to repair the legs and the claws and the gear in case they break. So this being a large storage area does make sense. Does make sense. Um, I'm thinking though, maybe I'd wall off this area here a bit. But nah, I can just leave it open for material for for just maintenance access here. It'd be a little bit easier that way. I think this makes sense. So okay, great. Why don't we? Uh, why don't we just call that space done for now? This is our weapons deck, and then here is our. Um, um, maybe we'll call it. Um, Loading deck. Um, cargo deck. Well, cargo deck is going to be on the inside. Once we get onto the inside of this place, this whole area here is going to be that free floating space, and then we'll be able to have like proper crew quarters inside. Okay, great. So the the commoner crew will be on the under deck inside here, below the storage region. That works out. And then we'll have the and then we have the floating deck in between for the actual free float storage that happens through this uh, through this portal here. <clears throat> and then once you flip that, now you're working with the kitchen and vocaf material storage. And then above that is the um, um, is the um, um, observatory deck and uh, the throne room. And then above that is Vogue has actual living quarters. So this isn't actually that difficult. It's, uh, we just have to, um, yeah, we just, we'll have living quarters here and then, and then uh, below, quote unquote, on the other side of the living quarters gravity deck, that's where the arena starts. So the bottom, the floor of the arena, when you flip gravity, is also the floor of the living quarters for the commoner crew at the front center of the ship. That makes it easy for them. So we could actually have stairs that lead up into this area if we need. That's not a bad idea. We can put stairs in here. So once we start building out the uh, the living quarters, which will be this area forward as well. Once we start building that out, then we'll know we can put some stairways in here and here to get into this interior space that then lead out to the outdoor here. And there'll be a doorway that separates the uh, the the. Um, the um, servants, uh, the servant quarters from the storage deck. So there'll be like a little balcony area here. Yeah, that makes sense. There'd be a balcony area here that we could free float stuff into uh, into the uh, into the gravity plane here, that would then just be able to be carried over interior into the into the servants quarters here, or floated um, zero gravity this way. To then go up to vocaf side when you flip the gravity you just lift it up and then it will be in the uh in the proper area for um um, um vocaf uh vocaf um like the kitchen and all that kind of crap uh and then above that is yeah the observation deck and then vocaf's private quarters bump 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 so we'll have stairs that go up from the under level past 
the uh, pa past the throne area up to Vokast chamber, and that leads down to the zero gravity, which will get us quickly to the Dragonfly ship. I think this is going to work out. Now, we're, we're chipping away at it. It takes a little bit of time, but I think, I think we can potentially, in a two-hour block of time, I think we can potentially work out each deck. I think we can do that. So the next deck inside of here will be all interior space minus this cargo hatch here. So we'll still be able to use the outline. These the these leg gears will still be down facing and then after we work on the next layer, we'll flip gravity and we'll be using the top side facing legs and and, uh, and claw gear. And then building out the storage the the storage area here. And then we'll have the bottom of the arena. How does how does that fit? That's perfect. That's perfect. So here's the arena. Yeah. And all this all this interior space here would basically be the size of the servant quarters. That's fucking perfect. This is working out, man. This is working out a lot better than I thought it was going to. There's not a lot of bullshit I'm having to concoct here as we go through this process. I'm, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> okay. I think, uh, I think I'm going to cut it here, though. So... Uh, this is, I think this is a, a good... Like, if I can take care of one or two decks... Per session, then we're we'll, we'll be moving along really nicely. And then once we get to the top side, out of the servants' quarter area, it'll be really easy because that stuff's already technically mapped out for us already. We just gotta add you know some amenities and details to it. So, but yeah, so that probably means we'll have the the, the basic floor plans built out uh, by the time. By, by mid-May when I want to run the playtest for this anyway. So, oh, I'm really excited. I, I, I kind of really want to run a, a long form. I'm, I'm, I'm really tempted to just run a campaign on Saturday mornings once we get done with the playtesting for, for the Marshall Power System. I'm, I'm really tempted just to set Saturday morning as a gaming day. Uh, I, I am, I'm weary at actually doing that because I don't want to commit myself to, to locking down my Saturdays that way, especially if I need to get into a creative burst. I don't want to say, hey guys, sorry, I, I can't game because I need to do all this shit. <clears throat> but I, I'm excited about martial powers like a lot. All right. Anyway, we'll figure it out. So, hey, okay, great. So, um, I'll be back tomorrow morning. We'll continue working on Eberron, NPC, and Monster Tokens for the uh, for the Act 3 dungeon. Uh, I will not be here for lunch tomorrow. I got to go downtown and, uh, and and do some FaceTime at the office in Seattle. And uh, But I will be back Wednesday morning, and then I'm going to have a Marshall Powers lunch on Wednesday. Um, and then um, Thursday, I'll be downtown again. So, uh, and I'll have to go down early in the morning. So I don't know if I'm going, I'll be streaming in the morning or not. I don't think I will because I'm only going to have like maybe 45 minutes at best uh, before I have to jump on the bus and, and gun down. It's like an hour and a half bus ride to, to get to downtown Seattle. It's a little crazy. Um, so I, I'm going to gun that way. And then... Um, but I'll be back in time for um, more of this on Thursday night. And then Friday morning again, uh, we'll have uh, normal Eberron stuff. And then Friday lunch will be our uh, final prep before the, um, uh, the, MTG, the MTG play test on, on Saturday. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward uh, to getting back into MTG D&D, a DM build because... I've, I've been thinking about that five room, those different five room dungeon arrays and how they can scale because like each tile is a 10 mile square and there's multiple floating islands. I can use a random die roll 
to arrange where the floating islands are inside of that 10 mile tile. And then where each dot is, like each point on that, on that point crawl in the sky, I can zoom in and have a separate five room dungeon for each of those five points that are floating to show how those are different. And then each space in between the points, like that's at the 10 mile scale. And then I can zoom down to one mile scale and have a five point scale inside of the one mile space representing each island that's free floating. And then I can either have, uh, have them connected or separated. So I can have uh, a floating layer of, of, uh, of scaled map of just ambiguous sky islands that I can then zoom in, zoom in more to a specific location. So if we really wanted to deep dive into this tile and really fuck around inside of it, then we'd have, uh, we have the ground scale, which has the, the base five point crawl where it's safe to walk and where it's open water. And then above that are the floating islands that has its own five point uh, map to show where the islands are at. And then each node again zooms into that. And then in the water area, um, uh, we can further divide that. So we're working with scale again, 10 miles, one mile, and, uh, and then it gets ambiguous from the one mile or 500 foot scale down to anywhere you're at inside that 10 mile square. I can just drop down a grid and at the five foot scale and just quickly sketch in like, you know, stick figure style, what the general terrain is around, whether it's ground, water, or open space, and whether it's structure or, or open nature ground, uh, I'll be able to quickly layer that stuff in. And anytime we delve into an interior space, like a floating island, if it has hollowed spaces that the team dives down into, I can just, I can just stack, I can just roll a D20 at each level to create another five, uh, five room dungeon at each level inside of the structure. And depending on the size of the structure, again, each point node can be dropped down to smaller and smaller five room dungeons that can be further parsed down to smaller scale to become five foot. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking the minimum size for a dungeon node would be 50 foot scale. So we'd have 50 foot scale, 500 foot scale, one mile scale and 10 mile scale. So there'd be those four scales that we would be working with at any given time. And that's pretty manageable. It sounds insane, but it's actually really manageable because the team only is only going to delve into specific, uh, so many specific spaces. And I can build those on the fly as entry points and, and drops uh, like a drop points. So that should be actually really easy just to be able to random dungeon on the fly if necessary. And since we have a general idea of what kind of creatures are inside of each tile that we're building, it's quick and easy to populate those if we do like a, a hard dive into any specific area. But then I'd be able to do that with every area. So we are effectively, I'm really excited. We're, we're that, that basically helps set the, 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 um, the, uh, the, the, the means of building an urban hex crawl via five room dungeons, just parsing out the different scaling of five room dungeons into Russian dolling down to smaller and larger scale. So fuck, that's, that's actually really fucking cool. So, um, yeah, I guess, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, I've geeked out enough for the day. <laughs> so we'll go ahead and just, I guess, leave that at that. And, uh, that's our interior Top, that doesn't matter. Crab frame. There, that's where we're at for now. Okay, cool. So yeah, I'm just gonna go ahead and leave this be. And uh, yeah, hey, thanks a lot for hanging out, Shed. I will see. Uh, I'll see everybody uh, hopefully tomorrow morning. So cheers, later, guys.